Hello, everyone. Thanks all for coming, including those that are still coming. Welcome to the Holy Grail, a persistent Hasharay mapped tree for C++. We'll get to the pronunciation in a minute. Um, before we do that, just to introduce myself quickly. So I'm Phil Nash. Uh, a number of you will know me as the, the author of the test framework Catch. Uh, but more recently, I've also um, been employed by uh, JetBrains as developer advocate. Uh, as you probably know, we're a sponsor of the conference this week. Normally, when we sponsor a conference, we'll have a booth and you can come up and talk to us there. But of course, we don't have booths here. But we've got uh, four of us from JetBrains here, so do track us down by our JetBrains t-shirts and come and talk to us. Um, but I'm not going to talk any more about uh, JetBrains today, other than that we, we do have you know, a few C++ tools that you might be interested in. Um, what we're going to be talking about is just pure C++, specifically this uh, persistent hash array mapped tree that uh, I'm going to explain word by word what that actually means as we go through this. I'm conscious of the fact that there's probably a number of people in the room that know more about this stuff than I do. Um, I'm going to try and you know, have something for everyone in this talk, but uh, we're going to go through, um, well, first of all, all the theory behind it, some of the background, uh, look at some performance, and then finally look at some code if we get time. So, before we start, that, that title, I had the Holy Grail exclamation mark because I wanted to make a, a bold statement, but maybe we should make that a question. Is it really the Holy Grail? Um, and what I mean by that is I'm going to present a container that um, makes very little in the way of trade-offs compared to sort of other containers in you know, different ends of the, the spectrum. Uh, I'll get to exactly what I mean by that a bit later, but um, I have to confess that um, when I uh, first wrote the abstract for this talk, I was basing it on my memory of a proof of concept I'd ha had a couple of years ago. And uh, since then, I went back and had a look at it, and it wasn't quite up to scratch and had a few shortcuts and things um, that maybe made that claim sort of slightly bolder than, than I intended. So I had to rewrite everything from scratch, uh, which I, I've been doing for the last few weeks. So we're going to see as we go through whether I, I still meet um, the claim that I made in the abstract, which we'll, we'll repeat as we go through. But uh, the first word I want to look at Actually, it's just uh, the last word there, and I just want to get the pronunciation of this, because I've been calling it tree. A lot of people call it try. Um, that's actually okay as well. Um, but the reason is that it actually, actually comes from the middle of the word retrieve or retrieval. In fact, if we look on Wikipedia uh, under tree, it says that trees were first described in 1959. So like so many things coming into the mainstream in, in software development, it's actually an old idea. So it's well understood, it's been around for a while. It was a couple of years after that that uh, Edward Fredkin uh, coined the term tree, and it was him who said that it's pronounced tree because it comes from the word retrieval. However, other authors pronounce it try in an attempt to distinguish it verbally from tree. So there's a couple of reasons I've gone with the, uh, the tree pronunciation. The first is um, I'm not, I just like to be historically accurate. Um, and if you think about it, um, a tree with this spelling is really a superset of the more general tree, T-R-E-E. -E. So it's not actually as ambiguous as it might sound. But the second reason I prefer this pronunciation is because I don't want to become known as the guy that does try and catch. That's just <laughs> going to be a bit too much. So pronounce it how you like. Um, the important thing is what it means, and we'll come on to that a bit later. First, let's talk about sets. And actually, I want to talk more generally about associated data structures, but um, I'm going to argue that actually we only really need to talk about the sets for this to be relevant. So we've got eight associative data structures in C++. Here they all are, as, as, as a current standard at least. And you can divide them at different ways. So I've sort of separated them into these quadrants and uh, sort of paired them up in an obvious way. So you can see we've got the single and the multi versions. I'm sure you're all familiar with what the difference is, just that the, the, the multi versions can have multiple values of the... <coughs> the same identity. Um, the, the single versions only take the first one, even if they're actually different values. Um, but under the hood, the, the, the data structures behind that are basically the same. So uh, I'm going to rule those out, because uh, for our purposes, uh, they're, they're not that relevant. So that boils it down to, to these four. So now we've got the choice between uh, sets and maps. And again, the underlying data structures are generally going to be the same. In fact, you can implement a map in terms of a set, just by having um, a, a set of pairs where the, the first item in the pair is the key, and that's what partakes in the comparison. So we don't really need to consider those either. 
So now we just get down to these two sets. That's why we say we're talking about sets. But before I move off this, just uh, one honorary associative container, the, uh, the sorted vector. Um, and if you've got data that um, you, know, you load up front and you can sort in one go, um, and you don't need persistence, which is going to be relevant as we go on, uh, this can be a really good alternative, at least to set, um, maybe even an alternative to an ordered set. So I thought it's worth mentioning that, and we will sort of touch on that a bit later as well. But really, we're just going to talk about these two for now. So what are the characteristics of these two sets that sort of separate them in terms of what we're going to be talking about in this talk? The first is the underlying data structures. Now, it's not required that set be implemented in terms of a red-black tree, but it's almost always the case. In fact, I don't know of any cases where it's not. Um, pretty much has to be some sort of binary, balanced binary tree. Red-black tree is usually the, the best choice all around for that. Um, we're going to look into red black trees a little bit more um, in the next few slides, so I'm not going to talk more about them now, just mention it here. And similarly, for an ordered set, uh, implemented in terms of a hash table, uh, so you have a one-to-one you know, -one mapping between a, uh, a hash integer and a set of buckets. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that either. Um, but then there's, there's the requirements on the types. So for a set, we have a strict weak ordering. Uh, usually implemented in terms of the less than operator. But of course, you can provide your own predicate as well. Um, and it's strict weak ordering because the ordering itself doesn't guarantee that um, you'll have unique uh, values. So you may actually have values that compare the same. Um, that's a constraint on the set itself, that uh, it will only it will reject uh, duplicates. Um, an unordered set has different requirements. Uh, they have to be hashable, which uh, usually implies specialization of standard hash. Again, you can provide your own. Uh, and equatable, so equals operator or, or a custom predicate again. So it's got those two requirements. So that, those requirements may actually in themselves dictate which uh, container that you use most of the time. And then of course the complexity guarantees. Perhaps the most interesting part for, for most people. Uh, set is uh, log n on uh, lookup. We're only looking at uh, the find operation for the moment. Um, whereas unordered set is constant time which just sounds so much better. And of course, in practice, generally vastly outperforms set. So where performance is uh, critical, we will usually reach for unordered set if we're going with the standard containers. Um, but notice it, it is uh, linear in the worst case. And we don't often get to, to that, but it is something to, to keep in mind that there is a limitation there. Uh, and there is a reason for that that we'll, we'll look at a bit later. So that's a bit of background about the containers we're gonna be comparing against. We will dig into particularly red black trees a bit more. But I want to take a, another step back, talk about our first word from our title, persistence or persistent. And this photo is uh, me after the London Marathon last year. And I, I put this up here because I wanted to illustrate one of the things I'm not talking about when I talk about persistence, not that type of persistence, but it's also not persistence in terms of databases or saving out to files or any sort of uh, you know, serializing out to an external file format. That's not the type of persistence we're talking about, just to be clear. What we're actually talking about is where you make a, a mutable operation on one of these containers, rather than actually mutating that in place, it will give you a mutated copy. So the original version persists. That's, that's where the word comes from. So naively, you might think that that would imply a lot of copying. Um, so the trick of a persistent data structure is not so much the persistence itself, it's in making sure you efficiently share as much of the common state as possible. And there are different tricks depending on the, the shape of the container. So to illustrate, I want to start with a really simple example with lists. And lists aren't that popular in C++ because they're not particularly cache friendly. And you know, we usually have a much better alternative in terms of uh, vector for you know, contiguous memory. Um, but they are the bread and butter of the functional programming world because they're so easy to make persistent. So let's have a look at what we mean. Um, I'm going to whisper through this quickly because I'm sure you know exactly how a, a singly linked list works, but that's what we're going to be talking about here. So we'll have a series of elements um, wrapped in a node, and the node will have a pointer to the, the next node or the previous, depending on which way you look at it. Um, so the first one we usually refer to as the head, and the rest, or the first one of the rest, is the tail. Um, so far, so good. I mean, that's pretty much how standard uh, list works as well. But when you add a new item to the, to the head, of a list, all you need to do is create a new node and point to the previous head. 
And the interesting thing here is the previous list doesn't need to know anything about the new list, and yet they're sharing all their common state. So you'd normally have some sort of a wrapper type, sort of maybe the list type itself, that has the pointer to the head, uh, and maybe a, a size, so you've got constant time access for that. So if you keep both versions around, then you are very efficiently sharing all that common state. And of course, you know, you can remove items in the same way, just point to a, an earlier head. You've now got three lists and you know, stack these things up however you like. So if we can keep multiple generations like, through, the, through the history of mutating this list in memory at, at the same time, for as long as we need. And if we don't need them, we just drop their references and we're just down to the same set of nodes that we would have had if we'd be doing it all mutably. So it's a really nice property of a singly linked list, if you do it that way. Obviously, it's not so efficient if you have to do operations further down the list. That would imply a lot more copying. Um, plus, of course, there's other reasons why it's not so popular in, in C++. But that's just a simple way of illustrating persistent data structures. It gets more interesting when we talk about tree structures. So we're getting closer to, to red-black trees, but we're not quite there yet. This is a, just a simple binary tree. So we've got that, that strict weak ordering. So all the values are arranged in order from, from left to right. <coughs> and um, we have two pointers in each node now, instead of the one in the list. And this ref represents less than or greater than, and that's it, nice and simple. So if we want to introduce a new value into this tree, well, we'll need to uh, traverse down the list to find the slot that it needs to go into, which could actually be one of two places, but we, we usually prefer to insert uh, onto a leaf. And to put it down there, we'll need to write a pointer into the parent uh, down to, to the new node. And if we're dealing with uh, a mutable data structure, then that's, we're done, that's it. But if we want to make this persistent, we can't do that because we can't mutate this version. So we'll have to take a copy of that node and write the pointer into the copy instead. But if we do that, now we've invalidated the pointer in its parent, so we'll have to do the same thing all the way up to the root. So that's typically what we'll have to do in a, in a tree-based structure. Take a copy of all the nodes up to the root. And now we've got a new root, then we actually have two trees. We've got the original tree completely preserved, knows nothing about the new one. We've got a new root with new branch down one side, but all of the rest of it is common shared state. So it's not quite as efficiently sharing the data as the list, but it's still not bad. As this gets quite wide, you'll actually be sharing the majority of, of your tree. The problem with this, though, is that um, without any sort of balancing, these trees can get very unbalanced, particularly if you load them up, uh, for example, with, uh, with ordered data. Uh, you'll just have like a, effectively a linked list down one side. So we need some way to, to balance them to maintain our log n complexity. That's where the red-black trees come into it. It's a um, popular way to, uh, to balance binary trees. Um, this is not a talk about red-black trees. You, you, we could do a whole talk on it. Uh, but I do want to just sort of very quickly go through the rules of a red-black tree just for illustrative purposes. So if you're not familiar with them, you haven't seen this before and you don't keep up, it's not a problem, but it's, it's not that complicated either. We have this set of rules. Um, the, the implication is that each node, as well as the pointers, has something that says whether it's red or black. We can usually do that without any additional space overhead. And we say that the root is always black. That's the first invariant. All red nodes uh, only have black children. New leaves that we introduce are always red, at least to start with. And here's the one that really sort of makes the whole thing work. All paths from the root to, to any given leaf have the same number of black nodes. So if we maintain those invariants, then our tree will only ever vary in depth by, by a factor of two to one, and usually sort of much more compact. So it gives us a very approximate um, balancing of the tree with actually very little um, sort of, you know, looking beyond our immediate set of nodes. So it's, it's quite a nice uh, arrangement. So let's have a look at what that looks like in practice. This is the same example we just looked at, but now with the red-black colouring. So we've introduced our new node down there that I've highlighted, and we can see we've broken the, the red node invariant. We've got a red node that has a red child, which is not allowed. So to fix that, we, you always consult the, the parent node, the grandparent node, um, and any uncle nodes. So we'll, we'll be looking at the, uh, the, the three nodes around it. And all we have to do here is just recolour them. So we'll, we'll just switch those colours over. Now within that little subtree, our invariants are preserved. But in the tree overall, we now have another red node violation. Red node with a red child again. 
So we just recursively apply those rules going up. And oftentimes you'll actually have to shuffle the nodes around a bit to meet the requirements. In this case, it was just recoloring. Um, now we get up to the root, we've got a red root. So we'll need to um, recolor that black. Uh, that's an easy one to do, it doesn't change anything else. But now we've maintained our invariant for the whole tree and we have exactly the same number of black nodes on each branch, which you should be able to easily see. The thing is though, on the way up, we touched all of these nodes. So in terms of persistence and which nodes we need to copy, as well as all the nodes in the path to root, we've got these additional collateral damage that we have to uh, also copy. And this is quite a simple example. You can actually get a lot more shuffling of nodes going on, a lot more copying. So there is an implication in terms of persistence and there are some optimizations you can do. My uh, previous role, we did have an implementation of a, uh, of a red, persistent red-black tree. And what we did is, because you, you really need to have um, reference counted nodes, reference counted pointers. Um, we had an internal, internally reference counted pointer. And uh, what you do is as you, you're going down, traversing down to find the place to put the new node, you, you make a note of the sharedness. As soon as you hit a shared node, by a shared count of more than one, then you assume everything else below that is also shared. But if it's not shared, because you've already got a new root or nothing else can see it, then you can actually make the mutations in place. That's allowed because it's local. Um, the, the mutations are not visible anywhere else. So we're maintaining our global immutable variant, invariant, but also taking advantage of mutability. And what we found was the overhead of persistence on a red black tree as compared to standard set was about 10% on insertions, which was not bad considering what we got from it. Because now when you have your, um, new root given back to you when you make a mutation and the original tree is preserved. If you put that somewhere um, sort of shared across threads, you can just do an atomic swap on that and you get very cheap consistency. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit later as well in the context of the, uh, the hash tree, but um, it's, it's worth pointing out. So if you look on Wikipedia under red black tree, there's a section that says that Red black trees are also particularly valuable in functional programming, where they're one of the most common persistent data structures. So not the first person to do this. Used to construct associative arrays and sets, which can retain previous versions after mutations. That's what we've been, been talking about. Then it talks about the persistent version having uh, log n um, space as well as time. So that's all good. In fact, that persistent red black tree served us really well, my previous role. But going back to comparing that with unordered set, you know, we, we noted that unordered set has uh, you know, much better performance, certainly much better complexity guarantees. It'd be a shame if we have to give that up in order to go back to a red black tree just to make it persistent. So can we make hash tables persistent? And the short answer is not really. Um, as far as I know, you pretty much have to copy the whole hash table. Uh, you could sort of chunk it up, but then it's not really a, a proper hash table. And in fact, if you do follow that line of reasoning um, and go with sort of a layered approach, you start to get down the, the road of where I'm going with um, hash trees. But I'm going to approach it from the other side. Start with where we were with uh, binary trees and look at what the problem was. So the problem is the, the depth of the trees. So if you imagine a set of about 15 million items, then the tree depth is going to be about 24 nodes deep. So a lot of pointer hops, a lot of cache misses, um, and a lot of branches for every lookup. So that, that's the reason that that complexity uh, comes, comes to bite you, particularly with larger data sets. And we're pretty much stuck with that tree depth because we only have two pointers in each node. We can't really make it shallower. But if that's the problem, then the solution must be add more nodes, add more pointers. So yeah, we can do that. And that's actually what the, the solution to this is. But it does raise a couple of questions. And interesting enough, the answer to those questions is what's going to lead us to the rest of the definition of a persistent hash array mapped tree. So let's pull that thread. First question is, how do we know which pointer to follow? With the binary tree, it was easy. Less than go left, greater than we go right. We can't do that if we've got n number of nodes. And by the way, uh, we usually have 32 or 64 uh, pointers for reasons that should become obvious in a moment. Um, so let's, uh, let's put that in an array of pointers 
So we've got our array here. Uh, some of those are pointing to further branch nodes, some of them to leaves. Notice that not all of the, the slots are filled. We'll come back to that in a moment. But we want to know which of these we need to follow as we, as we go down. So this is where the hash comes in. We'll take a hash of the value, like we would with, uh, with an ordered set. So here's an example of a hash. It's probably one you know well, I'm sure. And then here's the interesting bit. What we do is we take the first five bits from the hash. Uh, five bits for a 32 um, sized array. Uh, six bits, we want to make it 64. Um, because five bits will give you a number between 0 and 31. So this particular series of five bits will give you the value 27. That's your index into the array. It's as simple as that. So we, we pick out the, um, the pointer in that slot, follow that, go on to the next one. And now we pick the next five bits in the hash. And we'll follow that. And in this case, we now get to a leaf. But we could carry on going, taking the next five bits and the next five bits until we exhaust the hash. So the implication, of course, is that leaves may actually be buckets like in a hash table. There may still, may still be a, a linear search at the end. Um, but that, that's where the tree comes in. That's what a tree is. So trees were more common with things like strings, like a string dictionary. You take the string, you break it up into characters. Each character can be converted to an int, and that will give you the index into an array for the next top down. Um, here we're just using a hash instead of a string. So it's a nice, simple idea. Um, but it's still a problem. This is the second part that I wanted to talk about. Remember I said that most of these slots are, are null here, mostly null pointers. And even for you know, quite big arrays, that's still going to be the case. <coughs> so that's going to be very memory efficient if we have to carry around these 32 or 64 pointer arrays in every single node. So we just did sparse array. And this is where the array mapping comes in. So what we do is we hold a compact array, which just has exactly the number of um, elements for the number of pointers that we have, three in this case. And then we store a bitmap, so a single integer, where the set bits correspond to the pointers that we have in the array. And then the, the unset bits are effectively nulls. So what we need to do is just do a mapping from that integer to our compact array. Um, and that's pretty simple, really. We just count the number of um, set bits to the right or the one we're looking at, and that tells us. So if you, if you consider the, the third bit on the, on the right over there, there's two bits set to the left, so the index is two. And that gives us the right, the right index in the array. Now, how we count the set bits is the interesting one, and I'm going to come back to that when we look at the code. But that's the principle. We'll, we'll revisit this a bit later. And that gives us now our persistent hash array mapped tree. It looks a bit like this. Obviously, for simplicity, I haven't drawn a big fan out of, of nodes, but you can have up to 32 uh, if we're using five bits. Um, but you've got some three pointer arrays there. Um, so each node is either a branch or it's a leaf that contains uh, one or more values. Now, because we're using a, a hash to descend down here, we're going to have a maximum tree depth of um, about six or seven. In fact, here we go. I've got the, uh, the details next. So the maximum depth is going to be about six or seven. The reason I say six or seven is because it's probably not worth the last two bits of the, the hash. Um, might as well drop those. Just gives you six deep. That's for a 32-bit hash. Um, that example I gave earlier with the 15 million values, we're going to have a, an average depth of five for that tree, which is a lot better than 24. And you're not always going to be going the, the whole way down, so that may be three or four nodes deep you've got to, got to search. So you've still got to do a little bit of pointer hopping. There's still some um, type of logarithmic complexity, but it's uh, nowhere near as, as bad as the, uh, the red black tree. So as I said, all the leaves hold arrays of values, uh, the like buckets. But because of the compact nature that we're, we're mapping these things, there's actually more space efficient than the typical implementation of a hash table. So that's another advantage. So the complexity is actually um, log 32n, which is a bit awkward to say, but you know, it's significantly better than just standard log n. Um, yes? Yeah, but they're not used because they're hard to 
So, so the question is, um, is there any reason the red black trees um, don't take advantage of, of more pointers like a generalized bee tree? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, technically speaking, red black trees are more like a bee tree with a fan out of four. Uh, you, you can model it that way. But, but the problem is if we're, if we're only choosing which pointers to follow based on um, a less than comparison, we can only go one of two ways. So that's where the limitation comes from. So this just gives us a way to, uh, you know, have a choice that gives us more, more numbers. Okay, so O log 32 and complexity. We'll see how that actually maps out in practice in a moment. And here's the like, surprise bonus. We don't need to do any rebalancing, unlike the red black tree, assuming we have a good hash distribution, because that's going to give us a good distribution of the tree itself. The flip side is if we don't have a good hash distribution, then we may actually end up with quite an unbalanced tree, and we'll see something about, uh, like that in a moment. Um, so that's the theory, that's the background. Now you know what a persistent hash array map tree is. Let's um, actually uh, start to look at uh, the, the practical stuff. So if you read my abstract on um, the, uh, the CPP now schedule, uh, you might have read this claim. This is what I was alluding to at the start. Um, remember I wrote this before I wrote this implementation. I said that they're close, but not quite as fast as pure hash tables. And hopefully now you can see why I, I might be making that claim, but how does that actually work out in practice? So I do have an implementation now uh, that, that's good enough to actually run some benchmarks. So let's have a look at the, uh, the relative performance. So here's my methodology. I've used a uh, micro benchmarking framework. Um, there are caveats associated with micro benchmarking, we know, but uh, this is what I've done. I think it's, uh, it gives us some insight. So I've used this framework called uh, nonius.io. Um, I haven't used a lot of micro benchmarking frameworks, so I can't say whether it's the best one or not, but it seemed to um, come up quite, quite a lot in uh, comparative reviews. Plus they use uh, catch to uh, test for implementation, so it, it can't be bad. So the way it works is the first thing it does is it will um, basically test the clock accuracy by doing a little bit of timing and seeing uh, what, the, what the jitter's like. So, so it knows how long it needs to run each, each case to, to get um, you know, a clock resolution that actually means something. Um, so once it's worked that out, it will then run whatever code you give it enough times to, to be um, meaningful with the, the given clock accuracy. And that's considered one sample. Then it will run n number of samples. Default is 100. Uh, for most of these, I've actually done it for 1,000 samples just to uh, give us a bit more data. Um, and then it will do some statistical analysis on those samples to give you the, the mean and the average after discarding outliers. So it's, it's pretty good. But we'll, we'll see exactly what that means in a moment. Now, this is all compiled with uh, Clang. Um, with uh, libc++. Uh, libc++ is relevant because I'm comparing against a set and unordered set implementation. So our implementations may vary. Um, and I've, I've done a few tests as we'll see. Um, the first one, um, just loading up with 100,000 integers in just a monotonically increasing series. So we'll see that, what that looks like. And as I say, I'm running the same data set with our hash tree and I'm abbreviating persistent hash array map tree to hash tree because it's just a bit easier to say. Um, on the page, I'm abbreviating it to hamped hash array map tree. Um, and then I'm running it with set and an order set as well. So, some graphs. Here's the most important one. Of course, we can't really have a set of graphs without this one, but uh, slightly more seriously, here's the first real graph. So this is inserting 100,000 integers. And I don't know if you can see the, um, the legend there, but the, uh, the blue bar on the left is uh, standard set. The green bar on the right is hash tree. And the, the orange bar that's so small it's more of a line, that's an ordered set. And the y-axis is time. So actually hash tree is not doing particularly well on this test. It's, uh, it's about four times slower than standard set and 20 times slower than an ordered set. So not really even in the ballpark for my claim. So, so what's going on here? There's, there's two, two factors, actually. Uh, the first, most important one, is, as I say, this is testing insert time. And 
insert at the moment is playing the full cost of being persistent and I haven't done any optimization on it yet. So that optimization I mentioned earlier where you check the sharedness and can do mutations in place. Uh, that's not been done here yet. So this really is the full cost of copy every single um, change you make. Uh, and there's other optimizations that haven't gone into it as well. So that's a bit disappointing because the, it is an important metric um, and that is you know, quite an overhead. Uh, I'm confident that I'm gonna bring that down much closer to the ballpark of at least standard set. So remember I said that I had a red black tree, persistent red black tree implementation before where we did do this shared nodes optimization. Uh, and that gave us a, an overhead on insert of about 10% compared to standard set. So I'm fairly confident that we'll, we'll get something similar with, with hash tree. So I'm hoping it's gonna be well, within 10% of unordered set, uh, but at least better than, than set for insert. So um, can't prove that yet, but that's my hope. So before we move off of insert, uh, the other thing, I don't know if you can see the, uh, the black line at the top of this bar. In fact, there's black lines at the tops of all of the bars and that's just um, showing us the variance. Uh, so there's quite a high variance on, on this one. Um, if we look at the, uh, the individual samples, because we can get that as well, you can see the, uh, the green dots at the top, that's the, the hash tree. Um, there's some big outliers right on this end. There's obviously something going on on my machine there. Uh, I tried to shut down as much as I could to, uh, to make it stable, but there's always something you miss. Um, so something kicked in there. Nonius has excluded those as outliers, but even the whole second half of that it's got quite a lot more jitter and it's, it's got a bit of extra overhead. So there was already something starting up. So I think to be fairer, we only really consider the first half of this. So I'm only gonna look at these uh, scatter plot uh, graphs uh, going on. because I think it's easier to, to visually um, see that. It doesn't really change the relative ordering or anything in this, but that is worth pointing out. So that was insert. So let's have a look at find. So I think that's gonna be more interesting given what we know. So same uh, data set. 100,000 ints, monotonically increasing. Uh, and now we're gonna look up each one of those integers in each of our collections. So now the top one, the orange dots, is standard set. The green one is hash tree, so we're already doing better. We're actually now better than standard set. And then blue one at the bottom again is unordered set, still doing way better. So we're not quite meeting my claim yet. We're better than set, but we're still closer to set than unordered set. So what else is going on? Well, as I said, this is uh, a monotonically increasing series of all the, all the integers between zero and um, 100,000. And on libc++, the, the standard hash implementation or specialization for integer is just the identity function. So the hashes are also gonna be all the integers between zero and 100,000. It's not gonna lead to a very well-balanced tree. So that, that's why I said before, you know, we are sort of reliant on the hash algorithm giving us a good distribution. And I think that's what we're paying here. In fact, I'll demonstrate that hopefully in just a moment. Um, and there's a couple of things we could do about that. We could provide our own hash function. I haven't actually added that facility yet, but, uh, but we could do that. But we, hadn't, we didn't have to do that with unordered set. So another thing we could do is we could have some sort of uh, hash remixing um, algorithm in there too, just to give it a, a slightly more random distribution. Um, given that, you know, sequences of integers and things, it's actually quite common. You get a lot of clustering around certain numbers, especially zero. So it'd be good to handle that. Um, but that's where we are so far with that. So let's try another one. I did, um, well in fact, before we do that, I also plotted the graph for all the orders of magnitude between 100 and a million. So that's um, you know, a collection of 100 integers, a collection of 1,000 integers and so on. And I, and I plotted that for all the containers. So it's interesting because with these different shapes of container, you'll expect to get slightly different performance characteristics at different you know, points on that scale. And so we do see uh, sets sort of diverging a bit earlier on and then converging a bit towards the top. But uh, the, the hash tree and the unaltered set are sort of basically following each other. They've got the same sort of profile uh, as we go up the scale. That's, that's quite interesting. So it is sort of mo more closely tracking the, the, the uh, hash table type of implementation. Um, but in any case, the, the green line, the, the hash tree is always outperforming uh, set. Just a quick question here. This, yeah? this is, you, the size of the set isn't changing at all during all these finds. 
Uh, sorry, say that again. The, the size of the set, the contents of the set are not changing at all. The contents the of the fine, string. Just no. fines. Th these are just fines. So, so yeah, sorry, the question is, um, yeah, I'm still not quite sure what the question was. <laughs> well, so, no, so, I mean, so I, I'm wondering, like, no, sorry. It's okay. Not, so sorry. we're doing exactly the same tests on, on each of the containers. We are, we're loading them up with the 100,000 or however many strings um, up front before we run this test. And then we're just doing that many fines okay. um, for each of the containers. Uh, so, strings yeah. or Sorry? Uh, yeah, so these are, these are still in Sana. We haven't got strings yet. You're right. Good point. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is the integers. So there's no, you don't have to test around the interleaving on the operations, but that's later. That's later, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're just concentrating on find here. And yeah. still the idea of 0 through week n aren't the numbers that would be in the set. Not random 32-bit numbers, but a restricted set. Um, yeah, th this, is, this is still the... Monotonic, sorry, the question was, this is random. Um, it's just a monotonically increasing series. So it's still um, painting the, the hash tree in quite a bad light because of that unbalanced uh, nature all the way up. Okay, so then we move on to strings. I jumped ahead there, sorry. Uh, I did this, exactly the same thing. Um, you know, 100 strings, 1,000 strings, up to a million strings. Uh, should also point it out, the, the time axis is now logarithmic as well to match. Otherwise, we get just a ridiculous curve. So I generated the strings basically just by taking the base64 encoding of the integers. Um, but that seems to be enough to give us a reasonably good hash distribution as well. And now we get a rather interesting result. Uh, unfortunately, the graphing software I use doesn't really make the labels very clear here, but um, the green line at the bottom is hash tree. It's actually outperforming an order set here, which is the blue one just above it, uh, both of which, of course, are outperforming uh, standard set. And all the way up, although they do sort of weave in and out a little bit, hash tree is actually outperforming an ordered set for strings. That's a really interesting and actually unexpected result. In this particular case, I'm not only meeting my claim, I'm exceeding it. So hopefully that makes up for it a little bit. Um, now, I don't think there's anything technically about uh, hash tables that mean that you couldn't write a, uh, a version of an ordered set that will outperform, or that won't outperform. Um, hash tree. So I'm going to put this down to a quality of implementation uh, issue, but I think it does demonstrate that we are in the ballpark. We are sort of really meeting my claim that we, we can do this. So there's a couple of caveats that we've discussed already, hopefully some ways to address that, but this is really getting to the heart of it now. But the thing with the integers was bothering me a bit, so what I did is I took, I took the hashes of all of these strings and then I used that as my uh, collection of, of integers. So instead of just the monotonically increasing one, we're getting the, the hashes from the string. So I, I did it that way rather than purely random. So we, we would hope to see similar results. And plotted that graph. And similar, definitely starts off hash tree winning. Uh, but then you get this weird sort of crossing over in the middle around the 10 to 100,000 mark. Um, and hash tree starts to be the poorer performer towards the top. Uh, but interestingly, set actually starts winning. Just, just past about a million, because I did this one um, up to 10 million. Somewhere between 100,000 and a million. And I'm suspecting that, that is um, probably down to hash collisions actually starting to become significant enough that it impacts the, the performance. Because with um, the way unordered set is specified, that it only has the requirement of uh, hashing inequality on the type. You can't do something uh, fancy like a binary search at the end when you have hash collisions. Pretty much has to be a linear search. So, uh, so I think that's why set's starting to win there. But interestingly, with, uh, yes, question. Did you um, play with the load factor? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I didn't. Uh, just straight out of the box. Uh, there's a lot of things that I, I could do here, but I just wanted to do sort of out of the box things. That, that's why I didn't change the, um, the hash for, um, for the first integers example as well. I just wanted to see how it runs out of the box. Um, so yeah, but because hash tree is not constrained by uh, the standard requirements, we could actually make it take advantage of a strict weak ordering. And when you have uh, collisions on, on the hash and you have an array 
to do a search at the end, we could make that a binary search. And I suspect then that it would be winning at the top as well. Um, but I haven't done that yet, so, so I can't prove it, but that's an interesting observation. So that's the, um, they're the only performances, performance measurements I've actually taken. Obviously there's a lot more that would be interesting that we could do, and I, I will try to do those over time. In particular, it'd be really interesting to see what the iteration performance is. Um, fortunately, my current iteration implementation is, is not um, production ready, shall we say, so I didn't think it was worth measuring it. Uh, I suspect there will be a, at least a constant overhead for iteration compared to at least red black tree, simply because it's got to do more um, sort of switching around there between each step. Um, but it shouldn't be too bad, I'm hoping. So it would be interesting to see that as well. Um, any more questions on these graphs before I move on? Okay. Because I now want to um, talk about the code. Um, I'm not going to walk through the, all of the code line by line, um, but I do want to, whoops, draw your attention to some of the more important or interesting bits. Starting at the bottom. So you remember this from earlier. We talked about how we do the, uh, the array mapping of the, um, sort of the hashed integers. And I said that this was an interesting problem, how you count the, uh, the number of set bits. And I came across this algorithm for doing it. Just pure bit twiddling. There's no branching in here. Um, it's actually pretty performant. Um, there's actually a whole page uh, on the internet somewhere. In fact, I'll put it in the comment in the code. There's a link to it. Also a link to a Stack Overflow answer. Um, it's quite an interesting read. And uh, that, that's actually not bad. But most architectures these days actually can do the count set bits. They're often called the, the pop count or the population count in a single instruction. So I also added uh, this version that calls the um, GCC or Clang built-in pop count, which assuming you compile with a certain switch will give you that single instruction. That's what I've done my uh, benchmarks with. Uh, if you do it without, Still, all the, the hash tree results shift up a bit. Um, most of the orderings are the same, except the ones where hash tree beats unordered set. It's now slightly worse than unordered set, but it's still in the ballpark, so that's promising. So if we do have to fall back on the, the bit twiddling version, it, it's still not that bad. But this is obviously better. So that's how we, um, we count the number of set bits to the right. Uh, we also need to do the, the masking out given an index. So this is the code that does that. I call it to too compact. So you give it a bitmap. It works out the, the mask based on the bit position. So in that previous example, um, the first bit is uh, bit seven, I think. So it will be the uh, whatever that actually works out at. Is that 64 or 128? It's 128, isn't it? So that will give you that. Subtract one, and then that gives you the, the mask. You can then pass that on to our count set bits once you've masked out the um, the rest of the bits. So pretty simple. Um, but then we need the, to get the, um, the, the bit position. You see we're actually calling a, uh, a function there. It's because this is actually part of a class like called uh, sparse index. Um, originally I just made it as a, a strong type def but I did a couple of uh, convenience functions as well. So bit position, just given the value, so uh, seven would uh, rotate that to give us the 128. Um, and of course we can access the value as well, but that's really all it does. Um, what I found early on was I was dealing with all these different indices, you know, the, the sparse index, the compact index, uh, we've got different types of hashes, chunked hashes and so on, all integers. And it became actually quite difficult, even with good variable naming, to keep track of which one was which. Um, and especially if you're passing them onto functions, it's difficult to know what they expect. So that's why I started using these uh, strong type defs. So, We've got sparse index as one. Uh, there's corresponding compact index as well. That's really a true um, strong type def, just contains the value and the means to get at it. Um, that, that really made things a lot easier to reason about. So just in use, um, they've got our, our bitmap. That's the thing that represents which bits are set. We can get a sparse index for some value like 16. And then we can say two compact on that with the bitmap gets us a compact index into our array at the bottom. 
So nice and simple once you've got those pieces in place. It was a lot harder before. The next thing is chunked hash. So this is the thing that takes our full hash and then we want to be able to progressively shift it and sort of peel out the next chunk. So we've got the, the hash itself at the top. Next one is the shifted hash, that's where we are so far, um, and the current chunk. Um, and then we've got some, some operators to, to help us move through there. Then we get to, you know, where it gets more interesting, uh, the nodes themselves. So we have a, a hierarchy. Um, so node is a, is a base class, but I've decided not to make it a, a virtual polymorphic hierarchy. We've got a non-virtual polymorphism. So we've got a, an enum, tells us uh, which node type it is. Um, and then we don't have any virtual methods, no virtual destructor. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the, the concrete nodes in a moment. Also note that we've got internal reference counting. I mentioned that we need reference counting. Because we're going to be sharing uh, nodes between different generations, that's really the only way you can do it without garbage collection. So we do need that, so I've made that atomic. Uh, and the rest of it is just to make the node non-copyable. Nothing uh, complex there. Um, and just to, to round out the, the ref counting, we have an add ref in relief, release. I'm not 100% sure I have got the memory order stuff right. I, I just threw this together yesterday actually. So that, that may need revision, but, uh, but I think it's all there. Um, you'll also note that we're calling standard default delete on the, the nodes. The reason for that is because I actually use placement new for the, uh, for the concrete nodes. Um, so we need specialized uh, delete with an explicit destructor call. And um, having a default delete specialization for those meant that you can still use them in unique pointer without any extra um, ugliness. So that's the reason for that. Okay, and moving on to the, to the leaf node. So that's gradually moving up. Um, so this is the thing that's gonna hold the, the array of values. So we've got a size and a hash. And then we've got this curious anonymous union with only one field in it, which is a, a fixed array of one item. So what's all that about? So the reason for the anonymous union is just so that we don't have to initialize these values on construction. So we're gonna leave this uninitialized when we construct uh, the leaf node itself. And the reason for that is because although we've got a fixed array of, of one there, we may actually have more than one. And that's why we use placement new. So we'll create a buffer big enough for uh, n number of values in there and we'll We'll just placement you that into that. Yes, Why question. Sorry? So the idea here is that we're, uh, the whole node, including all the values, is a single allocation. We don't, want, we don't want any extra indirection. I guess what you could do since there is aligned storage? Uh, yes. Um, in fact, I'll show you where I actually do do that in a moment. I'm not quite currently using um, aligned storage, uh, and there may still be an issue there. Uh, and sorry, I should have asked the, repeated the question. The, the question was, should I use an, uh, an aligned storage? Was that what you were going to uh, point out? Why do you use full not tight enum class, uh, not bool? Not enum class by default uses int. It's not so effective. Um, so the question was, why use the default enum class when I could use enum class int, which would be... Uh, you can use so, bool. Or, or use bool. Um, could do that. I'm not sure there'll be much of an advantage. In fact, also here, you notice that a hash is a, a size T. Um, we already said we only need a 32-bit int, and I did use a 32-bit int to begin with. Um, there were two consequences of that. One was I had to do static cast everywhere, or in a lot of places. Um, and the other was that it actually performed slightly better when I changed it to a size T. So for some reason, the alignment wasn't quite enough to to give us that performance. So I made that a, um, a size T. So I think it'd be a similar thing uh, with a more specialized uh, underlying type for the enum. I'm not sure we get any advantage uh, to that in terms of, it wouldn't really save any space for a start uh, and may actually have a slight performance overhead or not. Yes? Are you disadvantaging yourself from the benchmarks using atomics? Because the other ones don't support multi-coded access. Uh, so the question was, am I disadvantaging myself by using atomics when comparing against the others in the benchmarks? Uh, to some extent, yes, but bear in mind that the, the metrics that we're actually showing 
me favorably, uh, we're purely on find where we're not really touching the atomics. Uh, but there will be an impact on the insert and, and other mutable operations, I agree. But we can't really get aware, uh, around that. We're also paying the cost of persistence, which the other containers also didn't have to deal with. Um, but that, that's what we want. So we want to say, well, how does this perform, even uh, given that we're having all these extra copies and we've got the atomic uh, reference counts? Um, and if we can get that actually performing really well compared to the competition, then, then I think we're, we're in good shape. Right, I'm not sure I caught all of that, but I think the gist of it was um, if we put the other containers in some sort of um, uh, locked um, mutex or something, then we'll be comparing more like for like. Um, that may then be unfair in the other direction um, because we're not actually uh, testing concurrency in those benchmarks. But we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later. I don't, I don't understand why you use the atomic. So because of the persistence, when you, um, when you take a copy of one of these, yeah. um, the nodes, most of the nodes are going to, all the nodes are going to be shared initially. Um, so you may pass that off onto one thread and this off onto another thread. They, they're using separate values, but they're still going to... Um, you are supporting concurrency, even though you're not benchmarking it. Right, so I'm not support, I'm, I wasn't benchmarking concurrent access to a single value, which we'll come onto a bit later. So that could be a policy but, or something. Uh, so, I'm not repeating the questions, um, you were saying that uh, maybe we can make that a policy because sometimes you know you're only single threaded and you don't want to pay the cost. Uh, and that's true, that could be done. Um, I'm not sure whether it would be worth it. Um, but we'll see when, when I actually have more realistic insert benchmarks. If that still seems to be a bottleneck, then that may be worth considering. But I'd much prefer it to be safe by default. Um, and it can be very easy to get into some situation where it looks like you're, you're operating on two different values, but you still have a race condition. And I don't, don't really want to get into that. So, okay. So there weren't too many questions about the, uh, the rather unorthodox use of the anonymous union. So that's, that's promising. Um, the rest of it's fairly straightforward. It's pretty standard constructor, destructor. Um, because I'm going to be placement newing into the array, I have to explicitly destruct each value. Um, fairly straightforward, I think. So here's the bit that has the, um, where the aligned uh, storage should go. So I've got storage size, it just works out what storage we need. Um, we probably do need some sort of aligned storage in there, but I've tried to do it just by using side of. And I think in practice, that's mostly going to work. So it's, it's certainly been fine so far. But in any case, if we need to change that, it's just one place to do it. Then we have this um, method. This is still on uh, leaf node, by the way. It's a static method, create unpopulated. This is how we create them. Give it a size and a hash. Um, then we create our buffer of um, unsigned char, according to the storage size. Placement new, our leaf pointer in. Um, and notice also we're using uh, unique pointers everywhere that we haven't, although we're using internal reference counting, until we actually put it into something that's taking ownership, we're, we're keeping them in unique pointers. Um, and then we just return that leaf node by unique pointer. So it's called create unpopulated because although it's placement newing the leaf node, the individual um, values in the array haven't yet been set. So it's still completely uninitialized. So that's the low level function. And then we have the higher level um, helpers on top of that. So create just takes a single value uh, by our value reference and a hash. Create unpopulated. And then we place new that value in. Um, and then with appended, given an existing leaf node, we'll create a new version with space for one more value and place new that in. And of course, we've got to copy the, the other values. So it's a little bit messy, but it's, it's not terribly complicated either. Um, I think that's straightforward. Then we get on to branch node. So similar in many ways. 
got a size and a bitmap instead of a hash. So that's the thing that's going to, okay, another question, sorry. Uh, yes, um, so I'm not sure if it's worth repeating the question, but to call me out if I don't answer it. <laughs> so, so we had the bitmap here, and that's what I think you were talking about. This is what will tell us which pointer to follow next, or which um, item in the array holds the pointer to follow next. Uh, and then we have the array again, anonymous union with a uh, fixed array of one, this time of node stars. So. We are, we're using that manual reference counting and it, it's really manual. I did originally try doing this with shared pointers and actually was more complicated, uh, particularly getting all the moves right and things. I, I backed it out and did it this way and it was a lot simpler. Um, maybe you yeah, have a different opinion on that, but it was certainly simpler for me. So again, fixed size of one, but we're gonna be placement newing into a larger buffer. Um, but now in the destructor, We've got to, as we loop through the, uh, the children, we've got to decide what the actual concrete type is because we don't have a uh, virtual destructor. So we'll consult the, uh, the enum, which could be a ball, um, and then just do a static cast on the node. Pass that on to release. We saw the definition of release earlier. Okay. And then similar, we've got storage size. Again, actually that one, um, is even worse. Um, just pretend you didn't see st storage size. That definitely needs some uh, some line storage. Uh, create unpopulated again. The only real difference here is that um, size may actually be zero, but we'll still need to create it with a size of one. I think we actually fix that up somewhere else uh, because we may actually have an empty branch. But very similar otherwise. So we're going to move on. Uh, we've got some other helpers similar, like create empty, that's the one I was talking about actually. Create empty, so it creates it with a size of one and then resets the size to zero. Um, we, we do that because it's actually more efficient to always create an empty root node because then you don't have to check whether you have uh, null uh, in the root node. Um, and sometimes when you're traversing down the tree. Um, create single, just creates. Um, a branch with a single child in it using create unpopulated. So that's the equivalent of what we saw with the leaf node. But then we also have, interestingly, create pair, where we can provide it with, with two um, child nodes. In fact, they're always leaf nodes. This sort of drops out of the algorithm somewhere else that this was um, useful. Um, much the same other than that we have to make sure of the ordering because we have to make sure that the um, the bit in the sparse array corresponds to the order that we're actually putting into the array. Um, and then we have the insert. This is much more code, but it's not actually that complicated. It's mostly just dominated by the copying. We just have to copy up to the place we're inserting, which is in a certain position, write that in, and then copy the rest. Uh, doing the manual reference counting as we go. Um, but interestingly, we also have with replaced, which looks almost identical. In fact, these are the only differences. Um, so we could really probably make that one function. But that, that's just replacing a, uh, a pointer that's already sat in the array. Um, and you notice we're also using our uh, sparse index, strong type def there, to, uh, to know where to map into. And then finally on branch, the other interesting methods are uh, two versions of get at. Um, so we have one that takes a compact index, one that takes a sparse index, sparse index one. Just does the extra checking whether the current bit position is set or not, otherwise it's a null pointer. Um, and otherwise just forwards onto the compact index one. So that's where the, the um, strong type desk pay off again. You look like you want to ask a question there. Did you uh, go over, so if I understand it right, so this is my question. Okay. Uh, Right, so I think the question was, when we're doing an insert, um, we have to work out what position we, we put into the array, do we then have to resize the array? 
Um, let's, let's go back to that. That was, so we've inserted this one. Yeah, I'll brush through that a bit. So yeah, we're, we're always taking a copy of the array, of the whole node. Um, and the size is one bigger. So we've got, you see create unpopulated, um, just a few lines down, original size plus one. Then we'll copy everything up to the point that we need to insert. Um, write the, the one that we want to insert in, and then we'll copy the rest. And that was the only difference with the, we've replaced. It's the same size and we, we copy one less, basically. Okay. So we've got that one. Okay, and then beyond the nodes, the next interesting class is uh, called path. And this is still like an implementation detail, but this is something that can be shared between different um, sort of front end classes. And this is responsible for tracing that path down through the, um, through the tree, in fact, let's put that visually. So starting from, from a root node, you can be going on to the next branch and the next branch by following those sparse indexes or indices, and then potentially get to a leaf or to the last branch where the, where the hashes match. So this is the thing that actually does it. And what we're doing is we're maintaining the, the set of branches that we've already seen and the, the chunks of the hash that we used to get there as we go down. So that if we do an insert, we can rewrite those nodes on the way back up, as we saw in the, 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 uh, the red black tree earlier. So we've got two arrays, one for the branches and one for the, for the chunks. They're the same size. For some reason, it worked out more efficient to do it with two arrays than one array with, with two fields. And I'm not quite sure why. I would have expected the other, but maybe someone has some insight on that. Um, we also store the last branch separately because we don't need that on the rewrite operation. So that again is, is more efficient. Um, a chunked hash to, to help us sort of get down there. And then optionally, a leaf node pointer. So if we're, if we're looking for a, for a value and um, we actually have a hash map uh, match, we'll get a leaf value, otherwise that'll be null. Uh, and then the size is less interesting. And then the implementation of the constructor, um, it's not as, not as bad as it looks. Um, we just start off initializing some, uh, some local variables to help us, including getting the first uh, branch beyond the root. Then we, go into, we always go into this loop while we continue to have branches. So each, each time through the loop, we're picking up another branch. Uh, we're storing the previous branch in the array and its chunk, chunk tash. Um, we get the next node um, by, because um, we, we know that our node is a branch, so we're just casting it. And then we just increment the size, the chunk hash, that was one of the operations we saw earlier. Um, store the next chunk and get the next node. Don't know how clear that is there, but that's just calling that get at with a sparse index again. So we could go around there. There should only really be one branch here as far as I can tell. My original implementation had a couple. Um, so I'm hoping this is better for the branch predictor, but um, I think there could still be room for optimization there because on the insert, this is still a bottleneck. Uh, and then at the end, we just um, store our leaf node if we have one um, and the, the last branch. Um, so after that point, path is then uh, immutable. We've got all the information we needed, but we have this method on there called rewrite which again, it doesn't change anything. It's a, it's a const method. What it does is it will go back up that array, create copies of each node with you know, the new pointer to the next one um, written in. So that's quite a handy function that gets used quite a lot. So just to remind us what the, uh, what the tree looks like. So that, that path we looked at is like the, the highlighted path down there, uh, along with the, uh, the hash segments as well. Now, here we just got a root node. But in practice, like we saw with the, the list and the, the red back tree, we'll have some sort of container type. We're going to, going to call it hash tree, which has that pointer to the root and the size. And that, that's the only state that it has. So in fact, we're going to wrap that state in just a simple struct called hash tree data, because that's going to be used in a number of different places. The other advantage is that we can then use this atomically which we'll see a little bit later. But the hash tree itself, pretty straightforward then, because all of the hard work's been done in those helper functions and the nodes. So we have the hash data, 
um, some constructors, including um, copy assignment and move constructors, um, which just, just work in terms of the hash data. There's a helper there just to create that, that empty route that I told you about. Then we have uh, copy and move assignment operators, which work in terms of swap. Now, this is interesting because we're swapping these things and it's not, not an atomic operation here. So the implication is that this is not meant to be used uh, concurrently. You know, don't, don't share uh, instances of hash tree. We've got something else to do that, which I'll show you in a moment. But when well, you're just working locally, you've got one of these and you can, you can use it as if it's a mutable container. So we have an insert method, which will actually um, end up with a new root. So you can see new root there. That we'll, if we get one, we'll, we'll write it in. Um, so it will look like a mutable container, but the structure behind it is persistent. And as I said, most of the work's been done by all that supporting stuff. So we can actually trivially have different versions of this. So we could have an immutable hash tree. Uh, I haven't written that yet, um, but usually it's more convenient to do it this way. So you can see most of the work here is being um, delegated to the inserted helper function. You can see below, and even that um, is just determining whether we've got a leaf or not from the, from the path, and then calls another um, different set of functions. But we're always forwarding the, the value down, so we should get perfect forwarding all the time. Um, the first one of those, or rather the second one, add value at currently unset position. So that's if, if we didn't get a leaf, then the, the, the last slot is empty. So we can, write, we can create a new leaf node and write that in. So that's a fairly simple operation. Um, just made more complicated by the use of um, unique pointer there. But you can see we're, we're using the path, taking the last branch, and we're getting a copy with the inserted node. And then we pass that back up, um, use path.rewrite to get the new path up to root. The other one is more complicated. I'm not going to show you all of that. Um, all the code will be on GitHub, by the way, so you can check it out there. But the, the reason it's more complicated is because there's a few different cases. So this is the case where there's already a leaf there, but that leaf may not actually be a complete match for the hash. So the first thing we do is we say, well, um, do we have exactly the same value already in there? If so, we're done. We don't have any work to do. Otherwise, we'll say, well, does the whole hash match? If it does, then we need to add, uh, add ourselves to the leaf itself because it's a hash collision. Otherwise, we need to extend that path down further until the hash no longer matches. So we may actually add an arbitrary number of branch nodes. So that, that's where it gets more complicated. And I'm not showing all of that code. That's in this extend uh, function. Uh, but that's all it's doing. You should be able to get the principle, I think. Um, so now I want to go on to the concurrency side of it, because I sort of hinted at this already. And I think we've got time to cover this now. So I'm gonna, just going to show you the usage code first. It's just uh, in a test case. So we've got another class called uh, shared hash tree. And I'll show you this in a moment. So rather than using hash tree itself, we use ha shared hash tree. And you don't have all of the same operations available on there because that wouldn't be particularly efficient. What you do is you can either take a copy of it as a hash tree and you can work on that as much as you like. You can mutate it even. It won't affect what's in the shared hash tree. But if you need to do an update on, um, on that shared hash tree, what you do is you start a transaction. And that transaction will return a transaction object. And the, the transaction object, you can get a hash tree copy from it. You can mutate that, so I'm inserting some values here. And then you commit the transaction with that mutation. Yes, Jason. So the question was, could you commit the transaction automatically when you exit the scope? Um, you could do, although I think the, the better default would be the other way around, which in fact is how it works, that the transaction gets lost at the end of the scope unless you commit it. Because if something happened in the meantime, you wouldn't want to commit. So you might have like a half formed update. You, you want to know explicitly that you're, you're done. Um, and because nothing happens, if, the, if you don't call commit, nothing gets committed, it's effectively a rollback. The shared hash doesn't change. So it is transactional, but it's still a little bit fiddly. And in fact, commit may not work, may not uh, succeed. It's actually going to return a Boolean to tell you whether it committed or not. 
And the reason is because if someone, another thread has committed in the meantime, while you've been updating, then the, the original hash table that you had, uh, sorry, hash tree, uh, won't be the same, so the compare and exchange will, will fail. So you need to do this in a loop. I haven't done it here in the test because I know that it's not shared. Um, but normally you would need to check that. So, oh, well, the other bit at the bottom is showing how we can get just a copy of the hash tree at the bottom. We can do something with it. We're just seeing that we've actually mutated it. But to make it a bit more convenient, there's a, an update with function on the shared hash tree. You pass it a lambda. It gives you a reference to a hash tree that it's a copy that it's created internally. You can mutate that. And then when you come out of the lambda, uh, it will commit that for you. Um, and in fact, now I'm thinking about your question, Jason. I'm wondering whether that's going to, no, that's not going to automatically commit it for you. So I think we're OK. Um, so that just makes it a bit uh, cleaner, easier to work with. But if you need the flexibility of the low-level interface, you've got it. So let's have a look at how that's actually implemented. Again, I'm not going to show you all of it. So shared hash tree itself, we're sticking the hash tree data that we saw earlier into a standard atomic. Uh, but that's why I wanted to put that in a separate struct. Um, needs to be trivially uh, copyable, so I'm just asserting on that. Um, obviously, a 128-bit um, value like this is not guaranteed to be lock-free. Um, I did test it on my platform, and it was, uh, but it won't always be. So I've actually exposed the as lock-free function all the way up to, to the top, so you can test it in your own code if you need to. Um, then we've got the, uh, the constructors. The empty one is the same as before, but then we start to get the uh, interaction with the standard atomics. And again, I'm not 100% sure that I've got these memory orders right. Uh, I need to look into the implications a bit more. So anyone that's an expert on uh, memory order semantics, um, please let me know. Um, sorry, what was that? Uh, ah. No, I'm not, not going to say it loud. Okay, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm quite prepared for those to be wrong, but um, that, that's, that's all that would need to change, I think. Um, so obviously accessing that data via the atomic every time is going to have you know, some overhead, even if it's lock free. So that's why you don't want to operate on that directly. But once you've taken a copy of it, and that's why you take the copy of the hash tree, um, you don't need to worry about the atomic anymore. So yes, Jason? I think I'm going to ask you a question okay. I haven't actually benchmarked this at all yet. Okay. Uh, th this wasn't in my benchmark code earlier. That was just defined. I think um, be my yeah. And see what it does. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely um, definitely try different variations. I'll just sort of make sure first of all it's correct, and then make sure it's efficient after that. Which I think is a reasonable order to do it in. But the point is, you only need to um, deal with the, um, the overhead of the atomics here when you're uh, taking a copy of the hash tree or you're committing one back. So, yes. Sorry. So Right, so I think the question was about testing on different architectures because there may be different characteristics. That's if you did like change the... Oh, I did change the memory ordering. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, it may work on some architectures and not on others. That, that's why I'm really keen to have someone that um, is an expert in mem memory order semantics to make sure it's correct rather than not just what happens to work on my machine. So, okay, and another question at the back? It's not correct. Okay. <laughs> We can talk afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. <clears throat> um, OK, so moving on. We're actually nearly done with this. So, um, so the op operator at the top lets you get a uh, copy of the hash tree. Once you've got that copy, as I said before, you don't need to worry about the, the atomics anymore, other than the, the, the reference counting. So that, that's quite a nice property. You've got an explicit place, the shared hash tree, where Everything is um, literally shared, but you don't pay the cost of it when you're actually doing the, the mutations. So that's quite an interesting property of this. Uh, start transactions, not 
that important. I'm not showing that one. Um, or the update with. Actually, we'll show that one in a minute. Uh, reset is the low level thing that commit will call. This is the thing that does the uh, compare exchange. I've done compare exchange strong here. So to, to do that, you need the original um, data that we had at the start of the update operation, the new data, and then more memory order stuff that, that may be wrong. Um, you'll probably tell me afterwards. So that's why we need the transaction object, because that's going to hold the original data um, so that we can commit it back. So the transaction object as well itself, as I say, it holds a copy of the base data, a reference back to the, uh, the shared hash tree so it can commit to it. There may be a lifetime uh, overlap in, uh, issue there. I'm not sure if it's worth addressing that or not, because I'm not sure of a good way of addressing it. Then the update with, that's the interesting one, because this is the thing that's going to do the compare exchange loop. So it's going to keep looping until it actually either successfully commits or if we didn't actually do anything in our Lambda, because then we don't, we don't have anything to do. So that's why we've got the two breaks in there. Uh, if you didn't commit, then we need to rebase, because now the shared instance has new data in it. We need to get that out, and that's going to be our input to the next time around the loop. So I think that's fairly straightforward, even though it's um, quite an interesting topic. And that's actually all of the code that I have to show. As I say, the, um, all the code is on GitHub as it currently stands. There'll be a link, um, not the next slide, the one after. So I'm just going to wrap up with a summary of what we've talked about. So I made this claim that hash trees can approach the performance of hash maps, be closer to them than, than standard set. And I think I showed that we've, we've achieved that in some cases, but there's still some work to do. So that, that's ongoing. Um, also said that they're more space efficient than hash tables. I didn't really prove that, but hopefully you can see why that drops out. Um, also that copies are cheap, uh, particularly just straight copies. We saw a few of those without even doing any uh, mutations. They're just going to be a copy of two integers or 128-bit integer. So very efficient and memory efficient. Um, talking of memory efficiency, we can hold multiple variations of a data set in memory at once. We didn't really dig into that much, but actually that was one of the big use cases I had in my previous role with the red black tree. Um, it's financial data. And we were running uh, scenarios against these financial objects where we just modify some of the objects um, along sort of different dimensions. So we had like a whole matrix of, of modifications. So we had a whole matrix of like often a three or four dimensional matrix of versions of our object graph all being held in memory at once, sharing significant amounts of uh, common data, which we couldn't do before we had a persistent version of the red black tree. So even beyond concurrency and other uh, things, these are really useful. And we showed at the end that it can be made, made to work quite nicely with concurrency, um, pretty safely, which is why I didn't really want to um, sacrifice that safety for the sake of speed in the single-threaded case if uh, we don't have to, but, but that's possibly an option as well. So that is the end of my material. So thanks everyone for listening. There's the GitHub repo. Um, the, the YouTube link is actually me giving a talk on functional C++ where I touch on some of the same subjects. So if you haven't seen that, that can be worth a watch. And then there's a couple of papers. Um, this is uh, Phil Bagwell's, the first one, Phil Bagwell's um, academic paper on persistent hash trees in C++. And then there's uh, another implementation by a games developer that's a bit more specialized. Um, that can also be interesting. And that's me on Twitter. So thanks very much. And yes, another question. Is function and it also the problem of hash in a similar way? Um, I think the question was, do functional programming languages also solve the problem of, of yeah. hash maps? And Haskell hash and Haskell. So um, I'm not quite sure what Haskell does, but I know that Scala and um, Clojure, their default associated data structure is a persistent hash array map tree. So this has precedent, um, it's, it's well used. I think um, the only reason Haskell doesn't do that is because um, Haskell predated the invention of them. So yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're well known. Another question there. Uh, so I have a 
comment and a question. So on the discussion on the cost of the um, atomic uh, reference counts. Yeah. Um, I built a similar data structure but for persistent vectors that I presented on Wednesday. And my implementation supports um, policies uh, for this. So this allowed me to actually benchmark this. Um, and at least on the persistent vector, it actually makes a significant impact. So, um, and actually what worries me is that the impact is getting bigger. So with the laptop I bought this year, it's actually like five times lower uh, with um, atomic reference counts. And with my other laptop, it was like, I don't know, two times lower or something. Uh, <laughs> so I guess uh, this is probably like a trend that is gonna continue. Um, Maybe the rest of the system got faster yeah. the comics yeah. is the same. The what? The rest of it got faster and the comics stays the same. So the question is, you're concerned about the overhead of the atomic reference no, counting? I, actually, I'm not concerned because I think that still um, uh, the balance still needs to face off. And I think there are other alternatives, actually, that if it really gets really bad, yeah. you can always uh, move to garbage collection and use like the GC or something like this. Um, but I mean, normally, like you still amortize this cost uh, to, for example, yeah. the time you spend, uh, you save in locking or, or um, copying the data. Stuff. So I think it's still good, it's, it's still something to be aware of, like in the long term uh, that it seems like atomic reference counting is getting proportionally uh, more expensive. Uh, so I think the summary is you are concerned about the overhead of reference counting, but it may be the best option, although garbage collection may be another option. Um, so I will say I didn't really dig into it that much, but what I've tried to do, and this is one of the reasons that I went with the purely uh, manual uh, approach to the reference counting, um, I could be very explicit about exactly where that happens. So when you initially create things with a reference count of one, there's no atomics involved there. Uh, there always is on disruption. Um, but if you never take a copy of one of these, then the reference count is, is always going to be one anyway. So destruction time is the only time you pay for that cost. When you're sharing it, you're typically sharing large amounts of data. And it's often only the, the root node or, or a few nodes on a path that actually have shared counts as well. So even then, um, it's not, maybe not as bad as you think, um, but it is still an overhead, I agree. And I'm not sure whether, um, if, there, if we did use a garbage collection approach, whether we would be able to do the shared nodes optimization. I haven't really looked into that, but that could be another issue. So the, the actual question I have um, is uh, about the, the lead node. So in your implementation, uh, you're using uh, like a bucket lead node, basically, where you can add as many elements as necessary when you run out of bits. Uh, I read in some of the literature of uh, this that um, some people are using like extensible hash functions where basically if you run out of bits, you can tell it, hey, can you give me uh, more bits until uh, you completely distinguish the objects in the worst case. Uh, have you looked into that? Right, so I think the question is, have I looked into um, other approaches to extending the, the um, number of bits in the hash by having a secondary hash, I think that's the question, is it? Um, I've had that in the back of my mind, but I haven't really looked at that yet. And I'm not sure whether it's worth it, um, because even up to 10 million items, uh, we will still perform pretty well. But I think where we may get um, uh, some sort of better option would be if we can have a binary search on the final array, because then we should be able to outperform the, the hash map as well. Um, but possibly a secondary hash is another option. Embed the value in the inner node. Um, it, it gets a little, bit, a little bit trickier if the value is bigger than a pointer. I think you can still do it. Um, I don't know, we can talk about that later. Yeah, we can talk about it later. Um, I'm not sure how to summarize the, the question, but I think you were saying you can, um, you can remove one level. I'm not quite sure I understood why. But, yeah. um, but there is obviously an overhead as well in doing a secondary hash. Um, as well as extra load on the, the user having to provide a way to do a secondary hash for their type. Um, so it's, it's something to consider. Uh, I want to explore the, just the binary search first, because I think if we can keep beating unordered set, then I'm actually quite happy about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you tell us what your iterators look 
Um, no, I, I could do. I, I could probably show you the code actually. Um, if we've got time, or maybe maybe afterwards. Maybe better to just catch me afterwards if you want to see that. But um, basically, all I'm doing is just the minimum possible to to move from the beginning to the end. So um, I'm I'm doing I've got a recursive algorithm for for going up and down the nodes. It, it could definitely do with a lot of optimizing. Um, I also need to think about whether I need to keep track of something like I did in the path, where I keep track of all the like a stack uh, of previous branches I visited and their hashes. Because um, I'm doing something similar to that in, in my iterator, but not exactly the same. Um, and a lot of it depends on whether I need to be able to use the iterator to also find an insert point, um, as you would with, uh, you know, say, a set or a map. Um, I think I can make it more efficient if you don't have to carry that around in the iterator, because I've got these fixed sized arrays. So th there's a few questions to, uh, to explore there before I settle on an implementation. Uh, but I can certainly show you what I've got. Um, you first. <laughs> is the performance of the data structure dependent at all on the quality of the hash function and even distribution of the hash function? And if so, is using std hash, which as you observe isn't really a hash function at all, actually a good idea? So I think the question was, uh, are there implications to not having a good hash function uh, or, or a good distribution? And if so, is using standard hash a good idea? Um, so first of all, standard hash is actually pretty good for, for a lot of things, and it's, it's the standard customization point for your own types. Yeah, but it's, um, it's used in the context of the unordered containers, which mm -hmm. then take it more than prime number, and that's where yeah. the distribution comes from. As you said, it's quite often just identity. But if you use it outside that context, it's not really a hash function. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to summarize that, but... Um, I think you were saying that, Does that it, it's only really designed for use by standard unordered set and unordered map, um, not necessarily as a general hash function. But that may well be true. Um, I did find that with string and my uh, hash, hash derived integers, it worked pretty well. So I think the cases where it doesn't perform so well, you can still provide your own hash function, like, like you can with um, unordered set, unordered map. Um, I haven't actually put it in my implementation currently, but that will be easy enough to do. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, but yes, the, the quality of the distribution does affect it, as we saw with the first integer example. Uh, when we've got a good distribution, we beat unordered set. Otherwise, we were closer to standard set. Because okay. you can possibly fix that with just doing some shifts and XORs and kind of bit mixing it to get the entropy uh, distributed better. Right. Um, so you're saying you can't actually fix that? after the fact. That may well be true, and my previous attempts at doing so bear that out. So uh, that may be worth looking at. So, so maybe just always providing your own hash function is, is the way to go there. Um, we're still seeing questions here. Yeah. Uh, have you tried going for a, a wider node? As in, right now you have 32, you could go up to 96 for a maximum of five levels, or 236 for four levels. Uh, yeah, I mean, typically the choice is between 32 and 64. Uh, you can go higher. Um, I've just done 32 for now, because that's just as far as I've got. I want to actually make it more customizable. But um, in that second um, link I've got here, the uh, ideal hash trees and implementation, games developer did it. He actually commented that he tried 64-bit and it performed um, worse for him than the 32-bit version. Um, he also uh, admitted he didn't know why, and it was probably something he was doing wrong. but. Um, I haven't tried it yet, so I can't really bear that out. Um, it does mean that your, um, what was the implication? There's, there's some other implication of it. I forget what it is now. But th there's some trade-off. The wider you get, you, you pay a trade-off somewhere else. So it's not necessarily um, going to be better. But yeah, you can certainly use, use bigger integers. Yeah. Did you um, look into open addressing, like a hash map with open addressing? Or uh, you mentioned sort of vector. I didn't benchmark against sorted vector um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not um, really a standard container. Um, you have to do the, the, the sorting yourself and make sure you maintain that invariant. Also, because you can't really make that persistent, not as is. 
so it didn't really feed into it. But if you, if you don't need it to be persistent and it sort of fits your requirement, then a sorted vector is still a really good choice uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, as always, you need to benchmark, but I didn't really think it was worth including that in the comparisons. Maybe I should, maybe you're right. Did you look at open addressing? Uh, no, I didn't. Maybe you can tell me what it is afterwards. Okay, any more questions? Are we, um, I think we're actually finished time, aren't we? Time for one more? Um, well, I'm not sure, maybe, okay. maybe not. Um, do you have a second to go back to the graph, the performance graph? Or performance graph or the, um, the, the rabbit-duck graph? The rabbit-duck <laughs> so, so graph. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so which graph did you actually want? <laughs> for the, the first integers? Or did you want the one across all the? There was the one with, yeah, that one. Um, so the, the x-axis is the number of elements and yeah. the, the, the number of finds is constant across that? So it's the number of elements and the number of finds. I do. They're the same? Yeah. So you're doing n finds on uh, a yeah. set or so some I'm, collection with n elements? Yeah, so I'm finding every element that I know is in there. So how, how can this, how, how can it possibly be that set looks so linear then? So the, the time axis is also logarithmic. So these so would both be big curves if, um, if I didn't make the time axis uh, also go up in orders of magnitude. Oh, so then why is unordered set looking, the curve looking so similar to, to set? Or oh, it's because it's logarithmic that it's really yeah. off by a a constant factor. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, so because thinking. because it's okay. logarithmic, although although that is a fixed looks like a fixed difference, well, it's still gonna gonna spread out. Yeah. yeah, so it's offered by a by a constant logarithmic that means if it's a multiple law, right? Yeah. Yeah. But so it actually the, the, the difference is, is kind of much bigger in some ways than uh, yes. no, looking the, at the graph. But that is a fair point. I did mean to point it out that Although it looks like a fixed offset, uh, the difference is getting worse over uh, the, the number of elements. But by a, um, not a constant amount, but consistent amount, mm -hmm. shall we say. Um, yeah, good point. Okay. So I think we've got more questions. You can come and talk to me directly. So thanks very much again. <laughs>